Uh, Chris Barth has experience in both fire operations and education. Chris translates the realities of fire behavior to homeowners and the public so people can make informed decisions about mitigation. His background spends, spans wildfire to wildlife and has taken him throughout the American West and into East Africa. Um, please welcome Chris Barth to the River District Seminar. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Steve, for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you know, first of all, that we're going to be taking a little bit of departure from the discussion we had first off this morning, and, and I want to say I, I learned a tremendous amount, so I thank all the speakers that uh, both uh, presented and were in the panel. That was, that was a wonderful lesson for me. We are going to be talking about something a little bit different now for the next uh, little bit here before lunch, and that's going to be about wildfire. Again, as Steve mentioned in the introduction, I've been involved with wildland fire in different capacities for the last 20 years, and and mostly now what I what I try and do is work with uh, a lot of a lot of the cooperators, counties, federal, state, local uh, governments, um, firefighters, all kinds of emergency managers, a bunch of different folks to bring them together, much like you guys have been discussing. Uh, except for I focus on the, the world of wildland fire as opposed to, to water. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that story to give you guys a little bit of perspective for those of you who might not be as familiar with wildland fire and how it, um, how it all comes together and, and uh, affects you all as uh, folks who live in a fire-dominated um, ecosystem. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, first of all, I, I've talked with some folks early this morning about um, they had some involvement in wildland fire in the past. And just to show hands, who's familiar, who's done anything in the world of wildland fire in their, in their lifetimes or careers? Wow, wonderful. So this, great. That's uh, You will all be the choir that I get to preach to for uh, part of this morning. and. Um, in preparing this, I wanted to try and emphasize, uh, as the title says, how fires start, what we do, and, and, and that wildland fire fighting, and then the after, what happens after. And, and I'm going to actually wrap it up with uh, what should we be looking at now. Um, but before I do, I want to get started with kind of building uh, what the precursors are, setting the stage of, of the wildland fire issue. And uh, again, then we'll work through that process. Um, as we go along. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about this year as well, but uh, the title of, of the seminar, Future, Present, and Past, and I uh, wanted to kind of correlate the talk, my talk this morning with that timeline, and we'll look through a similar lens. We'll also look through the chronology as, as fires develop. Um, again, as Steve mentioned, as he was ushering you to your seats, uh, just a little bit ago, this has been a huge year for wildfires in Colorado, as I, I know you all are very aware, but um, we have had more than 600 homes destroyed in Colorado this year, multiple fatalities from wildland fires. Um, some of the, the notable ones that uh, everybody I'm sure has heard about are Lower North Fork early this spring, um, the High Park fire and up in Fort Collins and the Waldo Canyon fire um, all started from different uh, di all started in different ways and nonetheless had, had a lasting impact and led to quite a few changes. Some of these fires have, are leading to qu quite a few changes in how um, fire organizations are responding to wildland fire. So going back a little bit in history, we have 100 years of wildland fire suppression, or excuse me, of wildfire suppression. And that's a deeper story, as I'm sure a lot of you might be aware, um, but the result is it's led up to a led up to a buildup of fuels in, in the wildland environment um, that were in part maintained by fire. Now there, again, that, that, that's a little bit deeper story, but we'll look at some slides and kind of see some of this come out. Uh, this is a photo from 1909. These are all photo points from the Bitterroot National Forest in Montana. Just as a reference, uh, quite a number of photo point studies across the West will tell the same story. I just happen to be familiar with these from uh, my time working in the Bitterroot National Forest some years ago. Actually, after they had uh, 
375,000 acre summer in 2000. So again, we're looking in 1909. Now, that's some that's pretty emblematic of what we talk about when you talk about historic f forest conditions. Um, again, there's more going on there, but going back to Lewis and Clark the, in the stories that were told, uh, this is what a ponderosa pine forest would look like. Uh, again, we have different forest types, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But wide open spaces, able to drive wagon trains through these areas. That was, um, again, that historical record of what the forest was like. And again, this specific forest type. Now, there was also some logging going on, as you would imagine. There was some harvesting of timber that was going on during this time. Um, and that's led to some other things that also impacted our, our uh, wildfire issue in, in the West. But again, going through time, you can kind of, same, same uh, focal point here in these photo plots, uh, but again, looking at growth in a almost 40 year period there, another 10 years, moving forward another 10, another 10, 11, and then finally this is the final um, slide of that time period or that spot at 1989. And so you can see the buildup of, of vegetation. And so if, I, if, if I've already confused you when I talk about fuel, what I'm talking about is the vegetation in, in these environments that leads to these high intense fires. Um, so that's a big part of the story is that we have this hundred years of fire exclusion. Uh, there was a policy early on in the Forest Service uh, that was it called the 10 a.m. policy. Again, some of you raised your hands might be familiar with that, where uh, folks were required to get fires out under control by the by 10 o'clock the next morning. We've learned a lot over time, as as you all have through your studies, and realizing that uh, we, in part, were exacerbating this this problem. And so we've learned from that and tried to make some uh, changes into how we do business in fire management. There's another causal factor that I'd like to talk about. Uh, Everybody's favorite, Smokey Bear. And you all, I know, know this story. You've all celebrated his birthday, I'm sure. Watched him in parades back in the day when he was on TV. In fact, he was on Thanksgiving parade this last year. Um, just celebrated a birthday in August. Uh, and ironically, there was another similar bear found in a fire just a couple, just a month ago or so. But Smokey Bear was one of the most uh, successful campaigns uh, the Ad Council certainly has done. And it really, embedded in people's minds that we had to put all fires out, that fire was bad and we had to put all fires out. So um, while we dearly love Smokey Bear, um, we recognize that that message that all fires are bad, everything has to be put out, you can, only you can prevent um, wildfires is, is not necessarily the entire message that we want to share, um, but rather it's a part of the message and we want to prevent unwanted human caused fires and that there might be a role for wildland f or for wildfire to play in the environment. But nonetheless, everybody loves Smokey Bear, and if you bring him to an event, you will get quite a lot of happy faces. Uh, looking at some other, again, causal factors or some precursors to this, uh, these are just, this is just a few that I listed down and, and uh, probably could argue the, the placement of some of them, but just looking at short term and long term, uh, weather events, what I put over here in the, in the very short term sense is what sort of weather are you having that is affecting that fire environment right now, whether it's a passage of a cold front or a rainstorm or the monsoons, getting into a little longer term, the monsoonal, uh, annual monsoonal flows. And then long term climate change, what, is climate, what kind of impact is climate change having on the environment and the fuels? and thus wildland fire as we're seeing across uh, the West in the, certainly in the last few years. Uh, again, I put drought in there, kind of in the middle. It can have some, it can be in either, uh, you could look at it in sort of an immediate short term and also a long term lasting impacts which leads into some uh, ultimate effects in the fuels and the vegetation, uh, causing them to be more likely to burn. Um, and then also lumping disease and in, uh, insect forest health issues in there in terms of environmental conditions. And, and again, you've heard a lot of talk about um, beetles in Colorado and what kind of impact those are having on our forests. And, and I'm not even going to begin to get into the politics because I'm sure that could be an entire seminar and, and conference alone just uh, finding a position on beetles. But nonetheless, there is an impact in how uh, forests respond and, and fires affect uh, due to these different environmental conditions. 
So when I spoke with uh, some of the folks that were putting this seminar on, we talked about we talked about how fire and patterns uh, move across the country. And again, somebody like myself who does spend part of my time traveling around the country on incident management teams going to large wildland fires, uh, we kind of have a culture that we know where we're going to be at different parts of the year based on fire activity. So I put together a couple of uh, slides just looking from, I believe it's from February, yep, February into uh, just this September is, is the most current map of this, but this is looking at national significant wildfire potential. Um, now this is a predictive services model. This is done at the beginning of the month, so it's looking forward of what we might expect, but I figured it was the best way to graphically represent how fire moves across the country throughout the, throughout the year. And to show that early on in the season, we start in the southeast, as we move through um, the months, then we start to develop some uh, fire potential or fire activity, fire season happening more in the, get a little bit in Texas, it doesn't show up here necessarily, you get Texas and then the southwest, uh, again, developing, moving up into western Colorado and, and more of the traditional west. Uh, as the season goes on, then it becomes pretty ubiquitous across the west and then as the end of the summer approaches, we move into the northern part of the country and then out to the west coast. So that's kind of that natural cycle of fire activity that we anticipate happening um, throughout the year. And obviously there's some anomalies and you can have a large wildland fire outside of a, a normal part of the season. But by and large, that's what happens. And again, those are all based on some um, very real weather uh, phenomenon that are influencing that. Uh, the difference in the two colors there is the red is above normal potential and the green is below normal potential. Everything um, else is, you know, just the, the average normal potential. But again, that red this year has shown generally how that, that pattern of, of fire moves across the country. So how do fires start? Uh, again, we're looking at um, how they start, the firefight, and what we do after. I'm going to go through these very quickly by the number of hands that were raised uh, just a little bit ago, but we've got a basic fire triangle. Um, those things taken together with a fourth element, the, the uh, combustion, is how we end up with fire. So we need, um, in, in this scenario, we need heat, oxygen, and fuel to make fire, and we've got our oxygen all around us. The heat source we'll find in a second that we can't really control when we're looking at wildland fire. So the only thing that we really have uh, ability to control or have an impact on is the fuels. So that's just a traditional fire triangle, and you notice I've got it uh, fire triangle squared on the title there. Um, in wildland fire, we add another triangle, which is the, the wildland fire triangle, and adds fuel characteristics, weather, and topography. So these are the things that influence the fire behavior and help us to understand what we might, we might be dealing with when we go and respond to these wildland fires. Um, these are very important things. Basic fire behavior is something that all uh, fire, wildland firefighters need to know and will receive some training in so that they can be perceptive to these things. Um, and that's quite a lot of the intelligence that we're looking at when we're sending folks out to the ground to fight wildland fires or planning for the future and the growth of these fires is we're looking at uh, a lot of these characteristics. So we'll take them apart one by one and try and look at them a little bit more. Um, but before we do that, we wanted to, I wanted to go back to that heat element in the primary, that first fire triangle. A lot of times people ask, um, and in fact, going back to Smokey Bear, you know, what are our causes of fire? Or do we have human-caused fires predominantly, or are we looking at something else? Well, in the area that I work in, which is uh, about 6 million acres south of here, um, in six counties just below Mesa County, uh, in west central Colorado, uh, I've done an analysis on our fire history, and what uh, we come up with is we, we do have both natural and human-caused fires. Natural, well, natural fires are lightning-caused fires, and then the human-caused fires get lumped into a whole bunch of categories. These bold ones are the primary categories, and this is really, these are really terms that we use for our fire investigation purposes, and then uh, miscellaneous is broken down into all the other things that don't necessarily fit. Um, but again, these human cost fires are get broken down into different categories. Well, what we see in, again, in at least my area, and I would suggest in most of the western slope, is that our causes are predominantly lightning caused fires. We have predominantly um, natural caused fires on the western slope. 
Um, you'll see in the front range that there's an increase in human cost starts. Um, and I would say that a lot of that has to do probably with the, the urbanization or the development around some, you know, the metro cities and those folks then going out in the woods and there's probably an increase in the human cost starts due to that. Now, uh, the example I showed here from uh, a plan a analysis that I'd done looking at Delta County kind of breaks down and I apologize if it doesn't show up well for you, but this large blue section, um, which is, I, if I can, I can't even read my own slide, I think it's 84% um, is lightning cost fires with the remaining 16% being various human cost starts. So um, that's a pretty good snapshot of, of where I'm at in West Central Colorado that we do have this predominance of lightning. It does vary by county and, and it, uh, there's quite a bit of variation really from 50% um, up to all the way up to 93% of lightning cause fires. Um, and again, the the greatest human cost starts that we tend to see are actually um, debris burning, uh, whether it's stitches or uh, vegetation material that folks are clearing from their land. So uh, when we're looking at prevention, that's certainly a, an important aspect of how do we prevent um, these unwanted fires from growing beyond what the person intended in the case of a debris or uh, ditch fire. Okay, so getting back to um, our, our above fire triangle, the wildland fire triangle, some of the things that we look at are these fuel characteristics. And so this will kind of get into where we're talking about, uh, you know, weather conditions and climate change and impacts that are sort of uh, clustered together and, and have a, an ultimate impact effect on how, how wildland fire behaves. Um, but we look at fuel arrangements, or excuse me, fuel types. What kind of fuel, what kind of vegetation is a wildland fire burning in? And in these natural fuels, grass, shrub, and timber. Um, but one thing that, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, that's becoming very real is the development of uh, f homes and you know the encroachment of uh, homes into wildland areas. And so we have uh, this other fuel type, which are which are houses. And uh, again, that's been what we've been hearing and talked about a lot this summer, with uh, more than 600 homes burned in Colorado. Um, but again, these, these basic uh, vegetation types of grass, shrub, and timber, um, we're also going to look at the arrangement of those. And there's, there's two ways to look at that. You know, are they continuous um, vertically? Do they go from the ground up? And we talk about um, ladder fuels and crown fuels and, and whatnot. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But are they continuous, overgrown um, from the ground level, the grasses and the duff, all the way up to the canopies of the trees? And then also they continuous horizontally across the landscape. Is there any kind of interruptions or barriers or um, thinning that has been done to separate the fuels as they move across the landscape? And again, uh, these are some different fuel types here than the historic photos I showed you, but there was more open space and without any kind of uh, mechanical control or fire control that the vegetation is filled in and grown and, and become more of a fuel bed. Um, for fires to get big and large and intense. Um, fuel moisture. So we're going to be looking at what kind of fuel moisture the plant itself has and how that influences how it's going to, to burn. Uh, there's certainly a period of time where we have the vegetation has quite a lot of water content in the plants, uh, in the plant itself, so that it's very hard for the plant to burn. And we'll see um, a lightning strike in an area with quite a lot of fuel and the fire won't move just because the vegetation isn't right. It's not at that level where it's going to uh, really sustain combustion. Um, but then again, we see where we're in these dire conditions uh, in, in, with the uh, heat of the summer before we had any kind of rains this summer, this was certainly the case where our fuel moistures were record historic um, levels in the 99th percentile of being record lows uh, in terms of fuel moistures. So that certainly is a big concern for us and something that we take into consideration as we're looking at where do we have our crews and how are we going to respond to these things. Um, and then also, uh, like I alluded to just a bit ago, that's life cycle dependent. What time of the year do these plants uh, mature and, and leaf out and when do they um, go dormant? So those are other things that we take into consideration as, as fire moves across a the landscape across the country, it also moves through different types of vegetation types, which is also part of that story I showed um, first with those maps. 
Okay, so weather, something that uh, I'm sure is near and dear to all of you. We look at precipitation, um, both in rain and snow. We look at snowpack levels. So early on in the, in the winter, January, February, uh, March, and March this year we were already out on fire, so it was, it was hard to be looking at this then, but we're looking at snowpack reports and percentage levels of where we should be at, and, and that tells us uh, it's a little bit of a forecasting tool for us to, to understand what kind of fire season we're going to have. Um, again, relative humidity, what, how much moisture is in the air, how much water is in the air will also impact um, how a fire is going to behave and what kind of conditions that we're, we're going to be expecting. Obviously, the more moisture is in the air, the less intense we can, we can expect fire behavior to be, the drier the opposite would be true. So when you wake up in the morning this time of year and there's a little bit of dew on your car, fire growth potential is fairly low, but when it's bone dry and everything's uh, cracking in your, you know, typical Colorado summer, then you can expect that fire to, to get up and move. And I highlight uh, on the next one on winds, I italicized it because more and more we're learning that these large fires are, are really, um, winds are such a big influence on, on the outcome of these fires as they, as they grow beyond our control and get large. Um, so winds is a, is a hugely important uh, factor and unfortunately not one that we really have a lot of um, say so in uh, about control, but it's certainly something we can anticipate and then respond to safely in looking at how we're going to um, position our resources and, and how we might attack uh, or fight a fire. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to be at the head of a fire when we have a large wind event, we might be doing something what we refer to as an indirect attack and going away from the fire, uh, maybe using the winds to our benefit in, in terms of using fire to meet the fire and put itself out. So these are all, again, these things are running through our heads all the time and they're factors that take into consideration, but the weather is certainly a large influencer in, in all of these. Um, temperature as well. Uh, and that kind of leads me into this, this piece of red flag warnings and fire weather watch. I'm sure you all heard about these things this summer. Um, I think this year we also had a record number of red flag warnings issued, um, certainly out of uh, Grand Junction, um, the weather center here in Grand Junction, and looking at the different fire weather zones that we have in the western slope. Um, I think it was in June that we'd already surpassed kind of the the typical average and uh, we're, there's been talk about red flag warnings coming up again this late in the season. Uh, but the red flag warning, when you hear that and you hear that on the news or you hear it on the radio, basically that means that conditions are ideal for wildland fire ignition and rapid propagation. So uh, we're on high alert when that happens. That means all of those things are in place. The high winds, the low relative humidities, the high temperatures, um, and, and those are going to cause a condition where if a fire starts or if there's a if there's an ignition a fire will almost likely always start and it will grow very fast um, the fire weather watch on the other hand is more of a warning or announcement that that's pending um, and you we saw these happening as well more and more frequently this year with confidence um, usually it's issued the day before perhaps two days before but this year again we saw them three days out because there was just that constant pattern of these conditions existing, again, going back to um, really early season, uh, what would be considered pre-season for us in a normal year. Topography has a great influence on, on, on the fire's behavior as well. Obviously, um, the lay of the land is what we're concerned about here. Fire likes to move uphill a lot quicker than it does go downhill. Um, and really the only thing that I've ever figured out that could do that um, very effectively. Uh, we look at some aspects of chimney. Is there a, is there a funnel, just like you would imagine your, your chimney? Uh, does, is there an avenue for the fire to be sort of closed in and rise up very rapidly? Um, at the top of the chimney, you're gonna have uh, quite a lot of heat build up as that fire races up there. Essentially, uh, the fire's moving up the landscape. It's preheating all the fuel that's up above it just by the orientation of the land. So it's the fuel above the fire is igniting very quickly. Um, conversely, trying to go downhill, that flaming front is further away from the vegetation. So it's just moves a little bit slower, typically going downhill. Now again, wind is the, the thing that really ruins that um, scenario for us because we've seen a lot of fires move quickly downhill this year. Um, that were wind influenced and wind driven. 
aspect plays into it in, in both the uh, amount of solar influence that the landscape gets as well as the type of vegetation that's growing on this. Uh, again, I'm sure you all are very aware in the difference between the southern and western aspects and the northern and either eastern aspects in terms of uh, sun and probably soil production, but also the vegetation types that you're going to find on there. Um, so those, those things take into uh, a play into how fire behaves across the landscape. Um, one of the important things that we look at in, in trying to analyze all this is what we call fire regime condition clash or FRCC, but basically that's just a fancy way of saying the departures from the norms. Um, as I showed you early on, that first slide, the historic fire conditions, that's a typical ponderosa pine forest where you'd see fire burn through there every five to 25 years. It would clean up uh, the, the litter on the ground, the fallen branches, the grasses, some new growth, and it would encourage the growth of healthy dominant um, species. Now, when that doesn't happen and you have other species coming into, into play and young trees growing up and it becomes a very overgrown forest, then we start to get away from that traditional fire regime and you are in that departure from the norm and what we would get into um, what we would call FRCC3, which would be the furthest extreme away from the normal. So we look at those kinds of things and, and, and ultimately um, proactively try to get back to homeostasis and, and uh, go back to historic conditions through some of the work I'll talk about in a second um, and, and dealing with wildland fire really before they start. But again, as I talked about, we've got, uh, you know, we've got different intensities of fires as well. These ground fires, um, surface fires, and again, the ground fire is burning in the duff. It's often, mis uh, it's often confused with the surface fire that's actually burning across the top of the, the grasses and, and the shrubs and whatnot. And then the crown fire, which gets up into the tops of the trees. Also look at high intensity, low intensity, and then a mosaic of those two. Um, but this, the pictures here I'll show, this is the same area. Um, this is in the Pike San Is, I believe, um, National Forest. But there was some fuels work done, and this is a thinned area and then a non-thinned area, and the, the fire went through um, both those places. And you can see in that thinned area that it was a low-intensity surface fire moving across the ground in a very, uh, what we would call a healthy burn, very safe. Uh, but then again, and you can see these trees and the density of them uh, without that thinning, it was a crown fire moving very fast, high intensity, and you're going to end up with different effects on the ground after the fire. And uh, we've got a couple slides to show that as well. But, but basically, what we're, we're shooting for is to have a um, low intensity mosaic type fire that uh, we have better options of controlling, but we we're, we're respond to the conditions we're dealt with, and, uh, and sometimes it's not ideal. So the fight, uh, we use an incident command system in wildland fire, and this is how we, were, we structure ourselves. It's, uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with this in, in business or military or whatever other careers you might be involved with, but, but basically this is a good way for um, wildland fire resources to structure and have a clear chain of command. Uh, one of the things that is also very critical because we have, uh, you know, sometimes up to 2,000 people on these large wildland fires. Uh, we don't want to get beyond a span of control or make sure that we don't have too many resources working for us and, and then lose that uh, control and connection with those forces. Um, so we, we maintain command and control by divvying up resources and, and breaking them out under um, a supervision after, you know, th ideally three to seven uh, folks, subordinates working for somebody, but we are divided up into different groups. This top group here is incident, the incident commander, the person in charge, um, has several staff working for that, that person, and that's called the command uh, and command staff. And then these other leads, operations, planning, logistics, and finance, um, that's part of the general staff. Uh, combined, it's the command and general staff. And those are really the lead folks who are managing the, all the resources on the ground. They're not the folks out there putting the fire out necessarily. Those folks are, you know, operationally we get down in into single resources, engines, tenders, tankers, all different kinds of stuff that we'll talk about in a little bit. Couldn't be done without the planning folk to help us develop a plan on how to respond to this thing as we're at, at some of these fires for month, a month at a time, uh, two weeks, at least maybe, you know, several days by the time you mobilize a team. 
Uh, and then logistics, the folks that make it all work, the folks that get us food and, and uh, showers and tents and you know all the things that we need um, basically develop a support network for us to live in a, in a tent city for an extended period of time. And then the finance folks, which are critically important for getting contracts established and making sure that everybody gets paid for the things that they uh, are doing. So that's how we operate. And then how we fight fire, uh, we use a number of different resources. And again, I, I had uh, lofty visions of going through quite a lot of detail on some of this, but um, we have engines, obviously. We have different kinds of engines. I'll, I'll talk about in a slide later. Some heavy equipment, um, bulldozers and the like. Uh, we have a lot of aerial resources uh, that are used in fighting wildland fire, and I'm sure you'll have some questions about some of these things as we talk about, or as it impacts water. Um, we use fire in fighting fire. Uh, we also use fire in prescribed burns to help prevent that large wildland fire by changing the landscape. And then just boots on the ground, folks with hand tools, um, and, and sometimes water. Um, ironically, water is not a big part of a wildland fire environment. A lot of the times we're using, we're, we're building line, digging line, um, preventing a barrier, removing that fuel from the fire. Um, but water, obviously, in, in the aerial resources you see used a lot, and you'll hear reports about how much water was dropped or how much retardant was dropped. And then in a smaller setting, a more local setting, a lot of times your rural fire departments are going to be using quite a lot of water because um, they need to get the fire out and get back to the station or get back to their job. So there's a little bit different tempo there um, in, in water use and, and, and resources. Um, in terms of engines and trucks that we use, we have we, we type everything, uh, even the positions. My you know my position, I, I I have a type so that when a fire in Montana calls and says we need this thing, you know that the thing you're going to get is the exact thing that you're expecting to get. So we're all typed. We have engines that are typed. Um, this picture here is a Type Three engine, and so if somebody says they need a Type Three engine, they know they're going to get these capacities in terms of its pumping ability, water storage capacity, bodies on board, they know that that's what they're going to get. When they order me, they know that I've got a certain set of qualifications to do a certain kind of job. So uh, we type everything and, and, and your fire departments are doing this as well for, um, for the state and for Department of Homeland Security. So all these things, there's a process to try and understand typing so that um, ultimately, we could all work together in a in a all hazard incident, and we would end up with things that we knew their capacities and capabilities. Um, but we do we type uh, engines, and then we've got water tenders down below, different kinds of water tenders that uh, basically talks about their capacity and pumping abilities. Same thing's true with aerial resources; those are also typed. We've got a number of different kinds of aerial resources. Um, this photo was just just came out yesterday in some social media. Uh, on, online story that I saw, and this is uh, what we call a VLAT. And it's a very large air tanker, really, really creative, but we like to use acronyms, so that's a VLAT. Um, but basically, this, uh, there's a couple of different kinds of these. This one's a BA something, something or other, but it's a, it's a huge plane. Um, they use some uh, 747s have, have been used by a company, and basically it's a, it's a really large plane, and there's been a lot of discussion about aerial resources, air, air tankers this year, in the number of them that are available. Um, and some folks had said that this VLAT wasn't very uh, useful in an environment that had a lot of topography, a lot of terrain, and it was better used in flatlands. Um, but this photo, uh, the story that went along with it was was highlighting the fact that this, there's some canyons and some steep country that this thing was flying in and it did so successfully. Again, we've got some uh, different kinds of air, uh, aerial resources or air tankers in different sizes, um, different capabilities, different capacities, different qualifications and and, uh, and again, a lot of these are very old, but there are going to be some new air resources coming on board hopefully um, by next year. Um, down here, I believe this is a C-130. I thought that was a pretty impressive picture. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but uh, that retardant, uh, dropping retardant, very, what seems to be very close, I think is somewhat of an optical illusion by that house. And then one of my favorites is a Sky Crane or Scorsi helicopter, which is a Type 1 helicopter, very large. Basically, one is the most capable um, item so a type 1 helicopter or type 1 engine is going to be like a big urban fire engine um, 
type one incident management team is a more qualified team than say a type two or type three. So type ones are, are sort of the thing that, um, you know, that get all the photos in the paper. But anyway, this is a, a sky crane that was uh, drafting water out of a, a pond. Um, so interesting thing there too, and kind of trying to relate things back to folks. These, to do this, there's an agreement that's set up with that property owner to make sure that they can do that. And then they're compensated through, again, on that chart you saw before, our finance and business folks who set up that agreement and make sure that um, they're adequately compensated for, for the use of that water. So the aftermath, and I know that we're, we're going to be getting to questions soon, so I'm going to try and get through this again as quickly as possible because I imagine you all will want to have some questions and talk about this. But I just wanted to point out that, as I was talking about earlier on, there's the low intensity and high intensity fire and mosaic, and that's kind of a combination of each. I was on the Whitewater Baldy fire, which you probably heard about in New Mexico, um, earlier this year, which was the largest fire in, in New Mexico's history, wildland fire in New Mexico's history, uh, just about 300,000 acres. And there was a lot of questions while I was down there. Um, I go out as a public information officer, and so I'm always talking to the public and working with the agencies and all the, the cooperators. And there was a lot of discussion that everybody thought that that was a very high intensity fire that destroyed the landscape. And there was a lot of waiting for f uh, the burned area response or burned area emergency rehab group, uh, the bear team that comes in and analyzes that and tries to develop a plan quickly to stabilize an, any damage from the fire. There's a lot of angst and, and eagerness to get this report about the burn severity. And what you see here is the red areas are the most intense. But then a lot of the fire, there was either very little fire effects or, or moderate fire effects. Um, and, and again, just some really concentrated areas where it was some extreme or high intensity fire, high severity fire. So that was a very good story. Now, it doesn't mean that it didn't prevent um, the possibility and, and likelihood, and I know they're still working on this, of flooding and erosion and wa uh, roads being washed out that they're going to have to address, but that's part of that bear team's work to develop a plan to correct that, um, ideally before uh, before it really has a, a long-lasting negative impact. But again, fires do burn with different intensities. Um, you know, you can kind of see some erosion happening here because of a high-intensity fire that really did uh, burn quite a bit of the landscape, destroy the ground cover, the trees. There's not any kind of filtering network there to, to slow down any um, rain. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is we have our fires and then the monsoons come. And so we have some disturbance on the landscape and then we have a lot of rain uh, that we, again, we try to respond to very quickly to stabilize the land before those heavy rains come. But again, in, in certain cases that doesn't happen. There's been a number uh, of stories in Colorado and it's escaping me up by the Heyman fire um, in 90, Buffalo Creek fire was a, big, uh, was a big scenario where that played out. So we have a lot of erosion down here. Um, but then we have, like I said, other places, and this is, a, this is actually a fire that was managed um, for multiple objectives uh, two years ago, and that wasn't really something that was done quite a bit this year just because of the vast amount of fires that were eating up a lot of resources. Um, but there was a, a fire that was managed for multiple objectives la two years ago, uh, again, or maybe it must have been two years ago. Um, but you can see, hopefully, in the slide, if it's not too far away or the lighting's not bad, but you can see where the, the fire burned through very, it was a very good burn. It is helping to burn up um, decadent overgrown vegetation and uh, also to um, allow for some new growth. So um, fire can do some good things as well. And uh, I noticed that I'm running out of time and I wanna have some time for questions. So um, I'll just leave this presentation here and talk just for one more minute about what can be done before the fire starts because that's really my job in, in my daily life is working with folks to try and improve conditions before the fire gets there and, and really where it matters to you all as, as uh, landowners and homeowners what can you do to mitigate or reduce the risk of wildland fire for you all um, and today I was actually there's an event going on right now in Denver 
with uh, a bunch of national agencies, Institute for Business and Home Safety, the National Firewise Committee's program, fire adapted communities, federal, state, local agencies, uh, the governor's office, like I said, um, to promote this initiative for Colorado, which is called Colorado Rebuilds Fire Adapted Communities. And the idea of fire adapted communities is one where we all uh, look at the breadth of things that influence the wildland fire uh, world from you know the the landscape to the building ordinances and and learn how to adapt better adapt with wildland fire um, so in that process we do some defensible space mitigation projects around our home we develop a plan to address capacity and uh, training for our fire departments we look at like I said building ordinances what kind of roof would be more resistant to a wildland fire ember storm than others. Um, certainly a non-combustible or fire resistant roof would be a better choice than a, a combustible one when you do have frequent wildland fires. Siding also plays into that. Um, we look at a number evacuation planning. How can fire departments better inform their constituents or folks in their districts about the need to evacuate in the event of a wildland fire? And again, that's something that I think uh, deserves a longer conversation, but I'll, I'll leave, uh, leave my presentation there and open it up for questions at this time and uh, hopefully can help you answer those. Any questions? Right. I'll wait for you to get a mic. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a common feeding of modifiers are beneficial in the sense that they clear out, they have to naturally clear out excess vegetation and it covers and it keeps on going. One exception to that is there are some areas in the West that are burning that have never burned before, ever, and are probably never recovered ever. And that's because there are many areas in the West, especially area areas like the Joshua Tree area and some of those. Where there's enough blind space between the plants and the fires don't normally propagate. You lightning strike, you bushes burn, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. But some areas where we have these non native invasive grass, like Mediterranean cheap grass, those kind of things, we now have a flammable carpet interconnected with everything. So fires that used to burn in bushes are now burning a million acres. Right. And once that happens, the perennials are destroyed. You end up with a permanent cheap grass monoculture. The speaker gave it one talk I heard years ago mentioned that one of what he was campaigning for was to have increased emphasis on firefighting in those kind of areas. Because those are not the kind of fires you want to get burned because the damage is permanent. Yeah. I, yeah, obviously cheap grass is a is a huge concern and a big issue and, and um, there's it's being addressed or looked at in, in a number of ways. One, some, some new research is pointing to some very positive um, fungus, I believe, and, and I think it's called the black, black finger fungus. Uh, I, I'm probably getting that wrong, but anyway, there's a fungus that is looking to be very positive at cheatgrass control in the West. So I'm hopeful that that might be a opportunity. You know, there hasn't been a lot in that regard. Now, yeah, one of the, in the planning efforts before the fire happens, when we, when we look at uh, the potential, certainly quick response in an area um, with that potential might be the right thing to go. And I know a lot of fire districts that, that do that. Um, we also look at if we have a fire in an environment that is either cheatgrass or is, is going to cheatgrass, we're going to be actively, uh, aggressively seeding it with native vegetation right after the fire to try and reestablish uh, a native mix as opposed to um, a dominant, you know, the cheatgrass coming in as an invasive and, and really taking over. Um, another thing that we are looking at uh, in land management as a whole, I think, um, is, is doing fuels projects to, again, reduce the intensity of a fire to try and decrease the likelihood that it's going to be intense and, and have the cheatgrass come in after the fire. And if it's, you know, again, if it's less intense and more natural, then you might get those shrubs coming back as opposed to a, a fuel blanket like you talked about. So 
it's a huge concern. It's something we take, you know, I know that all of our, our planners, fuels folks take very seriously and uh, we don't want to want wantonly go out into the woods and, and exacerbate a future problem because it puts, you know, everybody's life at risk when we do have that next fire. So appreciate the question and hopefully I answered it for you. Chris, since we uh, have a lot less natural fire out there in the place, um, what is the current strategy for reducing uh, the fuels since the natural fires aren't have been suppressed so, so often? Well, I wish I could tell you a really positive story, but um, as I'm sure you're aware, the budgets are declining, and we just had a meeting uh, yesterday talking about declining budgets and, and addressing fuels on um, both public and, and uh, private lands, federal and non-federal lands. Um, so from my perspective and from the program that I manage, one of the things that I look at is trying to pair up the federal and the non-federal Pro, uh, land fuels projects and identifying where there's really priority. So we developed this community wildfire protection plan that says in this community, whatever scale that might be, countywide, fire district wide, whatever, um, these are the vulnerabilities in this area. So you talked in the presentation this morning about um, plans and documents that sit on a shelf. We absolutely did not want that to happen. So what we do is we very aggressively implement those uh, recommendations in those plans. So if it says this is a high risk community, we know that that's where we're going to suffer large value loss if, if a fire affects that. So we work um, with that community to do fuels mitigation, defensible space around their area. And then that helps prioritize and influence uh, fuels projects on non-federal land. So we're really putting, aggregating those dollars in those fuels projects together to have a greater impact. Doesn't mean we're not out in the woods trying to restore forest health and reduce fire um, fire intensity and risk out in the woods, but we're finding that, um, you know, really to have an impact and reduce cost to the taxpayers on fire response and suppression costs, we need to focus around communities where um, typically that ends up costing a lot of money to fight those fires. Great, thank you very much.